Okay, I'm going to get started. Uh, it is my name is Bob Kelty. I'm the CEO from AMREF USA. I want to welcome all our nice AMREF supporters from both the US and Canada. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. Uh, I guess a couple just uh, housekeeping things. If everyone can put there who is not speaking, put themselves on mute, that'd be great. So we just don't have any interference. Um, so, and then also just kind of a little breakdown of what we're gonna to do today. Um, we're just, uh, Dr. Gitahi from, who is our Kenyan global, or our global CEO based in Kenya. He will be uh, interviewing Nice Lagante, uh, whose incredible book just came out on Tuesday. Um, and she'll be that. So we'll break it down a little. Uh, Dr. Katahi will start it off and then Nice will do a reading. Dr. Katahi will do some follow-up questions to Nice and then Nice will do another reading. And so, and then we'll be able, we'll allow for a Q&A afterwards, but really appreciate everyone join. It's, I've had an opportunity to read Nice's story. It's so beautiful, so wonderful. There's been incredible, you know, feedback from the New York Times on the review and the book is just wonderful. And I just encourage everyone to go out and purchase a copy. Uh, Dr. Katai, would you mind starting us off? Thank you, Bob, for the very uh, uplifting introduction of that. And uh, I am really uh, excited uh, about this new book by Nice. And I was actually at some point, uh, because this, this tree that Nice talks about in her book that kind of uh, was the tree on which she was hiding severally when I, when I look at the book and she'll talk to us about that. So I was checking out, because we have many fig trees uh, in Africa, and I found something very interesting. I'll read it for you, because the fig tree in one article is defined as the queen of Africa's trees. How apt. Now, this says the following. In Africa, there lives an extraordinary tree. She is queen of the riverbank, a monarch whose story stretches back millions of years. In tribal cultures, her mysterious ways have fueled myth and legend. They set her apart from other trees. She's a sycamore fig, queen of African trees. This is the tree that Nice is gonna to talk to us about, about her life, which kind of rotates is at the center of this great story of change from within. Uh, for many of you, this would be a fascinating conversation for all of us, that is. And when Bob asked me to uh, interview Nice about this new book, I was actually really, truly looking forward. He only asked me because he couldn't find a celebrity. So, I, you know, I am really happy that I filled this role. So thank you, Bob. Oh, you're a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't find a celebrity bigger than you. We asked, you know, everyone, but, you know, Beyonce was the only one that was talking, but she could not make it, unfortunately. No, thank you, Bob. I'm really honored because I've known Nice for very long. And Nice has, since I joined AMREF in 2015, okay. Nice has been a friend, a colleague. And in a way, you know, early on when I saw her work and uh, I thought I was proud to be her mentor, I offered to mentor her. But the surprising thing is that Nice very quickly became my mentor. I stopped mentoring and I started learning so much from her about changing society, about the work she was doing. I have spoken at many conferences and uh, I have learned from her. I remember one time I was speaking about um, giving agency to women in, um, I think it was uh, in, 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 in one of the meetings in, uh, in Canada on uh, Women Deliver. And uh, I jumped off the stage and this act was actually inspired by NICE because I have realized that for women like NICE and, and others, it's not about helping them. It's about actually removing the barriers for them to actually do the things they deserve to do to achieve their full potential. It's about, it's about barriers. And that's really how NICE has become my mentor. I started off as a mentor, but the tables have turned quite quickly. Um, and she's also taught me about how to write a book. And uh, this is it. So NICE, as, you, as I see your book and as you start the book, the story about how you came to be named Nice features quite well down there. 
an early connection to the wild fig tree that I've talked about uh, that grows in many parts of Kenya. Can you please read that passage for us now, all of us here? You may not have expected this, but could you read that passage for us? Uh, I think it should be from your book, page two to page five, if I'm not wrong. Just how you came to be nice. Read that passage for us, nice. We are waiting for nice to unmute. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gidinji, for the great introduction. And uh, yes, you're, you're still my mentor, really, but maybe we can continue mentoring each other. Uh, so I will read, uh, that is from page three to five, and I think it's one of the favorite parts I like reading in this book. So I will start. When I was born, people said that I had a smooth skin and bright eyes. My parents gave me the nickname Karimbo, meaning beautiful. I still like to tease my older sister, Soila, that when she was born, no one called her Karimbo. My mother said that when she, was, when she came out, her skin was wrinkled and her head ended in a sharp point. Even though uh, those who looked with the most loving eyes had to admit that she looked like a, like a corn head. We were wanted and loved, corn-headed or not. To a Maasai, no man is wealthy unless he has many cattle and many children. As soon as a baby is born, the father hosts a large party. There is tea and roasted meat for everyone, and people bring presents for the family. My father liked to show off to his friends. He bought a co-worker, a white Englishman, a white English speaker, to my celebration. Isn't she a pretty one? He said, watching me smile. Nice baby, nice baby. He could. I like that, said my father. We will call her nice. He also named me Reteti after the Reteti tree that grows in our part of Kenya. It spreads by sending down shoots that form new trunks. And after many years, walking beneath a single tree can feel like walking through a massive grove. Some people use oretiti back for medicine. The wood is strong, good for making sticks to help herd animals. The tree produces feed to feed animals and people. It offers shade in parts of Kenya that is often dry and dusty. In the days before, most of us converted to Christianity, people would pray under the branches of the tree and make offerings of cow or sheep blood in times of trouble. Some still pray there. The many trunks of the Oretiti can feel as cool and sacred as a cathedral. The Oretiti, people say, has many branches. It is a single tree, but it can support many people. When I was young, the children would tease me for the name Retetet. They would say like a bad drumming on a hollow log. I hated the name and I picked a new one, Nailante, instead. It was a traditional girl's name with no special meaning. I choose it because it sounded nice. My Auntie Grace says, the old name suits me better. Like the Oretetti, she says, I have grown to hold many people in my arms. I have, set, I have sent down roots, not just in my own hometown, but all over the world. People depend on me, Grace says. And if I fell, many people would weep. It is hard for me to think of myself that way in my heart. I still feel like a simple village child, but Auntie Grace has a point. I have devoted my life to saving girls from female genital mutilation, a brutal and sometimes deadly procedure. I have traveled throughout the world, met kings and celebrities, given speeches and received awards. 
I have helped thousands of girls. I am still rooted in a small Kenyan town, but I have spread my branches wide. It is fighting that I was named for a tree because it was a tree that saved my life. When I ran away from FGM, without the tree to hide me, my family would have cut my clitoris. I might have literally died from female genital mutilation, but even if I had survived, I would have experienced a different kind of death. I was a young girl, but after the cut, I would have been considered a woman and I would have been married off to an older man. I would have dropped out of school. I would have worked myself to exhaustion every day, caring for my husband and children. Instead, because of that tree, my life has branched out into something entirely different. That tree gave me life. The one I have now, the one that my father could not have dreamed of when he held me in his arms and told me lies. Wow. Thank you, Nice, uh, for that um, very humbling uh, early chapter in your book. And uh, in that section that you've read, you've kind of reflected quite a bit on the practice of female genital mutilation, which affects many girls worldwide. Could you reflect on the Maasai community where you come from? Because we, you know, this practice is all over the world. We know that millions and millions of girls um, face the danger of female genital mutilation. And many, many women have undergone female genital mutilation. For many of you in a particular country like Kenya, we still have uh, the statistics show at least more than 21% of women, of all women in Kenya have undergone FGM. If you do this, you know, you look at the national statistics now. So could you talk to us about what is the purpose in your community? What is, why do the Maasai practice FGM why is it practiced and what are the consequences for the girls? Where did you run away from it? Uh, of course, you've reflected on, on some of your desires. Could you talk a little about this, Nice? Uh, different communities uh, practice female genital mutilation of, uh, because of different reasons. And uh, I think probably for now, I'll talk about the community that I come from, uh, that is the Maasai community. Because to us, it's a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood, you know, if you look at Muslims or any other tribes and all that, for them probably it's because of hygiene, purity and all that. And uh, to us, it's what makes you a woman because in that community, if you have not undergone the cut, you're not considered a woman. So that is simply why they do it. And you know, morally the community. And I would tell people, it's not like they do it out of hatred. I think that's the culture they know. They do it to you because they want you to be accepted by that community. They know that if you have not undergone the cut, you will not be anything in that community. So uh, for us, that's how, that's why, that's the reason it's done, a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. So it's simply supposed to make you ready for marriage, ready to give birth. And that means if you have already undergone circumcision, you don't have a chance to go back to school you're married off when you're still a child. And after that, uh, you, you're still a child, but you have to give birth because you're expected to perform all the roles that you know, an African woman or a wife is supposed to do. So uh, I will say it's a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. That's simply why they do it. So because of this, and uh, you know, I know in your book, you reflect a lot about how this particular practice takes away the agency from the girls because they are seen now as women and they are married off. And this is part of what contributes to the big gender gap. So the gender gap at, uh, in school, at the workplace, in the labor market is huge, but it's even bigger in some of these communities actually that practice uh, female genital mutilation. Because as you said, if girls get uh, female genital mutilation, they get married early at, I don't know what that age, you can talk to us about that. Tell us what the age that is. It means therefore the boys proceed with school but the girls don't proceed with school. So you yourself wanted to continue the education and therefore you didn't want to be subjected to this particular practice so that you continue with school. And you had to run together with your sister, you know, um, once or twice, you are beaten, uh, you're brought back home, you ran away again to, and this fig tree really was 
was a solace for you. Uh, it was kind of your shelter. And when you ran away again, um, uh, the sister, your sister was brought back. And there's a chapter on this in your book. Could you probably read? And you could tell us your sister's name. Is this Soila, the one you referred to earlier, your older sister? Could you read this, this particular section uh, so that we can understand the particular circumstances around this tema? Yeah, so I will read and uh, that's one twenty one to one twenty two. Mm, I think that chapter title is Sacrifice. But I could not avoid home forever. As soon as I returned, my uncle announced that it was time. No running, no excuses. I had humiliated the family. He determined that I was not going to do it again. There was less ceremony this time. My uncle's wife sat with Soila and me, telling us that. Uh, telling us we had humiliated the family. That was <clears throat> that we were cowards, that we had to do our duty. There would be no new dresses this time, no lessons about becoming women. It was just Soila and me alone in the dark room, guarded by my aunt, waiting to become women in the morning. When she was finally convinced that we were asleep, she left us alone. I told Soila I was running again. I had been uncertain the first time I ran, coming so close to the cut, to losing my education and my freedom, and chased the uncertainty away. I knew now that I would run a thousand times if I had to. I was not getting the cut. I was not getting married. I was not going to school. Come with me, I said. Soila was quiet. She had been living. So Ila was quiet. She had been living in our town with my uncle. There was no boarding school for her. If she did not get the car, she would have to, she would have to live with the people constantly shaming her telling her she was a coward. You go, she said at last. She was the only first I had left. I shook my head. No, I said, I need you. They will catch us, you know it. I did know it. I remembered the last time. I knew that this time they might be angry enough to hold me down and give me the card then and there. If no one if, if one of us gets the cut, maybe they will be happy, Soila said. It was dark. I could see only the outline of her face. Let me do this for you, nice, she said quietly. She spoke with the voice of our mother. It was just like when we were smaller and Soila protected me from bullies. You can go back to school, nice, I am staying. I knew she was right. I knew I could not change her mind, but that did not make it any easier to leave her. It was close do to dawn, and if I did not go then, I would never get away. I ran to the same tree and hid alone this time. I felt the cold more sharply, and I cried. I ached to go back to Soila to be with her, but I knew I could not. As I waited there, I could hear the songs, and I knew that even if I went back, it would be too late. She was already gone. When it, when it was light, I ran back to school. It was much farther than my auntie's house. And no one was with me this time. When I finally arrived, it was late afternoon. My legs were shaking. I could barely breathe. When Miss Caroline saw my bloody feet and the tears streaming, streaming down, sorry, my, my dad stained face, she did not say anything. She understood that I was running, she understood what I was running from. She took me in, cleaned me in, and gave me bandages. Then she hugged me and told me not to worry. Nice, she said. You can stay with me. You are safe. 
wow. Um, that must have been very difficult for you, Nice, and for Soela, uh, who literally took a sacrifice for you. That's what sisterhood is all about. And throughout the book, you've actually been very open about these difficulties in your childhood, you and Soila, and um, also the difficulties and the physical abuse that, that you experienced, which is obviously not very easy for each of one of us to tell our story. So why did you decide to be so open and candid in this book, Nice? Um, so I think I decided to do this because I wanted to give hope to girls and women all over that um, no matter what, we can always be anything we aspire to be. And um, I know it's not only nice or so or any other person. I know many girls, many women, um, you know, there's a lot they had to undergo to be wherever they are. And uh, the other thing I realized is that I can't be in every stage to talk about my story to give girls hope. Um, but I just realized also I can be in every store book. You know, people can be, you know get books. You know, they can read about my journey, and uh, hopefully, it's going to inspire them. So then, as and, a teenager, then at this mm -hmm. point, sorry, nice. Did I cut you short? Yeah. Uh, it's okay. So, and I think also the other thing, um, it's fine, you can go on. All right, nice. And so you, you, you as very early on, uh, we see your courage through all this, nice. We see the courage. We see the book as your new stage, uh, as you've said, um, telling your story on your behalf. And I know it's, it's very, very difficult. And as you talk about all these issues, even talking about female gender mutilation, about your role as a teenager in deciding to work with your community to end female gender mutilation, it wasn't easy, it's not easy now, even as you tell us this story. Uh, in many instances, when you read the book, you find in many instances, you are treated as an outcast. You say to yourself that community, the Maasai community did not accept women or girls who are not um, circumcised. And therefore, even though you are treated by your peers, the boys, the village itself in school, I have personally been to some of these uh, places where girls won't run away from school and go get circumcised because of the ridicule and the stigma. So it's not easy at all. What kept you going despite all these challenges you faced? What is it that made sure you didn't go back and say, I want an easy life? What made you go through the had life to be who you are today. Yeah, and um, I think on that one, um, I knew definitely with education, I can become the woman of our dreams or my dreams. And with education, really, I can always come back to my community because I didn't choose to go anywhere else or do any other jobs, but I said, uh, you know, People did it for me. If you read the book, I, I have two people who are really important in my journey. That is my grandfather and my sister. Because remember, my grandfather is an elderly person in that community. And these are the people who really hold to culture and traditional more than the younger people. And uh, like my, my, my uncles did not want to support me with my education. They wanted me to be accepted by the community. That's why they wanted me to undergo the cut. But after some time convincing my grandfather, he supported me, he allowed me to go uh, to school. And uh, you know, you've heard when I was reading the first part that my sister had to sacrifice herself to undergo female genital mutilation so that I have a chance to, uh, to go on with my education. So these two people have really been inspirational to me. And I said, I couldn't do it for my sister. You know, I couldn't do it for my friends in school, so my neighbors. But it doesn't mean I have to keep quiet. I can do it to other sisters, you know, all over Africa, all over, you know, all over the world. And uh, that's why I decided not to do any other job, but to go back to my community and sit with them and talk about these issues. And remember, it has not been easy because the first time 
why they also saw me as an outcast. I was given all those names they give to uncircumcised girls. I was helping girls to run away from FGM because I ran away and I thought at that point it was a solution. But later on, I realized it's not a solution. Remember, we have girls with disabilities who cannot walk, who cannot see. Where will they walk, walk to? And remember, it's a cultural issue. We don't want to fight with our parents every day. We just want them to understand, yes, we are girls, but we also need a chance to continue with our education. Yes, we are girls, but we don't have to be married when we are still children. We don't have to give birth when we are still children. We also want a chance to continue with our education. But remember, um, at that time, it was not easy because it was a must for every girl to undergo the cut. So uh, uh, I was not able to convince people, but yes, the support of my grandfather made me realize that, you know, I can just do it to other people. And I think that's how I started really going back to my community and talking to them. It was not easy, it took years. And I think there are things I've learned in that community. Three lessons, maybe for the more than 10 years I've worked with them. And one of them is patience. When you're trying to change culture, you don't explain, you don't expect change to happen overnight or in a day or in a week. You talk to them today, they reject you, they call you all the names, but you can't give up. You have to go back to them. And remember the Maasai people, um, you know, I talk about them before uh, because I know them really well, because remember that's a culture that I understand and I know it well. I know the things I'm supposed to say in front of elders or young people. And there are things also you're not supposed to say because culture is very sensitive and you have to be aware of that. And uh, so I knew I would go back to them. They will reject me because remember even talking to men, it took me like three years for them to accept me just because I was a woman. They say, you know, we can't be addressed by a, by a woman. And to make it worse, it's a woman who has not been circumcised. So because I knew like really I have to be patient. I never gave up. I kept on going back to them until they accepted me. And uh, the other thing was uh, to talk less and give people time to talk more because sometimes we think we know everything, but it's always good to, for you to have probably a proper dialogue or conversation, always listen to the other person. They will talk about FGM, they will say it's good, it's what makes you a woman. They will talk about many advantages about it. And you have to listen to everything, even if you know it's not right, what they're saying is not true. And then now after you listen, you also have to talk less sometimes. Listen, and then out of that, now they give you an ear and you start having a conversation. And the other thing, because it's a community I also know, not to judge them, but treat them with a lot of love. And I think those three lessons have really uh, helped me when I was working with my community, working uh, back in my village. And that is really how they started accepting, accepting me. Because they also, at some point, wanted to feel like they are part of that change. They never wanted to be left out. They wanted to walk the journey with us. So it took time. And as I said, it's about changing culture. It's about changing mindset. It's about changing attitude. And you know, sometimes people say it's against the law and they really become sometimes very hard with the community. I'm not saying the law is not important. It's very important because you see in Kenya, we have the 2011 prohibition act against female genital mutilation. But you see the law itself by telling people it's against the law, blah, 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 will take you to court. That cannot help. It's important because we can shout about it. We can talk freely about it anywhere. But I think the law has to be on one side and a dialogue on the other side. So they go together. As much as we talk about the law, but we really talk to the community and raise awareness and let them understand that why are we saying FGM is wrong? Why are we saying it's important to also invest in girls' education the same way we invest in boys' education? So I think just working with them, being with them, not running away from that community because I was not accepted, uh, I think it has, it has really helped us, it has really helped me to be where we are. And up to now, I'm still in that community working with them. They have finally accepted me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful to work there. I don't think I would choose any other place to call home or any other community to live with because 
I always say the Maasai community, as much as it's known maybe for other things like the cat, which is not right, it's a violation of women's rights, but I think it's the most beautiful culture I know. It's the only culture that teaches you generosity. The small you have, you have to share with your neighbor. You know, it's the only culture that people are united. You don't find them fighting over other things. It's the only culture that we don't solve everything in court. Other things we just need to talk, have a dialogue and discuss it and become, you know, one family. So it's, it's a very beautiful culture with lots of love. I grew up in that community, even in my, I think my book, it's well described of how, you know, I, I, I got love also from the same community. So it, it's, it's a beautiful culture that I, I always tell people every time you visit Africa, every time you, uh, you, you, you come to Kenya, apart from going to national parks, apart from going to mountains and seeing them, I think the real deal is to go and see the Maasai people, how they are living, you know, you know they are dressing and just, just how beautiful it is, yeah. Wow, uh, it's a really, uh, I don't know, it's a touching story and um, your, your lessons of patience, uh, listening and love and listening to you. And uh, thank you very much for those who are sending comments and feel free to <coughs> ask questions tonight as well because I'll hand over to Paul for a question time. So feel free to put those on the chat. Uh, but I would like to ask nice now as we come to a close, you know, in your book, Amref is um, featured quite prominently. Um, Amref is 65 years old, so you found Amref going on. And, uh, but now featured so prominently in this powerful story of change. It's not that Amref employed you therefore you made change. You're actually making change. Amref just came to facilitate your work and you continued doing what you're doing even before you met Amref. So what made, what is it about Amref that made you work with Amref or that helped make your work possible? Um, I think one, uh, or it's many things, but probably I'll talk of one or two. And I think what most people don't know, and I'm not even sure whether it's in the book, is that uh, before I joined AMREF, I think I started working for an organization uh, called Afia Plus. And uh, I only worked for two and a half weeks. And I had a contract for a, like a year or a year and a half. And, uh, and I think that's when I started realizing what I really wanted to do. Because I think it was more, you know, working with, you know, going to the field and doing other things, not FGM work, not really work that is to empower your communities or make change. And I think after working there, yes, of course you want money, you, you know, you're employed, you, you want to take care of yourself and all that. But I think I worked there for two and a half weeks and uh, I just realized like, I don't want to be there. And, uh, and I don't know whether there's anyone from Afia, Afia Plus, you'll forgive me, but um, I just felt like it's not home for me. It's it's not what I want to do. And um, and I think after that, I stayed at home for some time when, when I was in college. And later on, I think Amref came to my village and they said, we want a boy and a girl who has been to school, uh, who can be trained as a peer educator, like a community teacher. So remember, I was a bad example in this community. No one saw me as an important person or someone would come and make change. So we had so many boys who, who has been to school because you know education was for boys at that time. But that time I was the only girl who had gone to school. So the elders, because they normally go to elders as an entry point. You know, when you go to the Maasai community, you don't just go first and talk to anyone. Uh, you know. There, there are those you have to go through the cultural leader so that they can give you blessings they can allow you now to go to the community because remember they are decision makers they're like a government only their own so you can't go without going through them and if you go it will become a problem later on so that's how i was chosen first to join amref as a peer educator uh, because they didn't have a choice. That's how I always say it's not like I was the best person or the best girl they wanted to go through that training, but because there was no any other girl. Yeah, that's how I got a chance. And uh, when I was trained as a peer educator, now is when, because before I knew about female genital mutilation, I saw my friends undergoing FGM. 
I saw what my sister had to go through. I saw my classmates and all that. Because remember, as a young girl, you have to wake up and go and witness other girls when they're undergoing circumcision. Out of it, I saw them. Out of it, I saw girls as young as 10 years being married off and becoming mothers. So, uh, you know, whatever I was talking about, it was like experience-based, what, what I have seen. But now when I was uh, elect, uh, selected to join uh, the peer education training with other young leaders, you know, from my sub-county, I think now uh, I was equipped with more skills. I had more information about FGM. I had more information on other topics on sexual reproductive health and rights issues. I had more confidence now, and I had an ally that I can say, I'm having this meeting, can you support me to plan? I have this meeting, maybe today we are talking about FGM, but I need someone who can talk about child immunization, you know, hospital delivery, uh, and they will send me a nurse or a health worker. We go together to my community and, and we talk. And I think that's how we started building our friendship together with them. And uh, we started working together. So I could go to my community confidently because I knew I had someone who was supporting me. We could go to other villages and we talk about these issues. Um, you know, before probably I was kind of shy a little bit. Uh, I say that, but people think I'm not uh, because of my journey and the things I did. But I think I was. I would stand in front of many people and then I'm like, mm -mm, no, I don't think I'm ready to speak and all that. So I think being with them, equipping me with skills, they also you know, made me realize that, you know, I can really talk to people, I can convince people and all that. So that was great because I could now go to different places. I, be, I started believing in myself more that I can make change and all that. And I started talking about that. And I think after like four years, I think I volunteered as a community teacher for four or five years. That's how I got employment with them first as a project office, uh, as a project assistant. Uh, for the UFPR, United for Body Rights Project, who are still working on FGM issues and child marriage and blah, blah. So, and I felt like it was home because one, I was working in a community that I understand. And um, not only me, if there's any organization I know that is really empowering local community members is Amref, not because I work for them, but you know, out of experience and the things I've seen. If you come to the organization I work here now, like 80% of the staffing we have there are local community members. Not only in the FGM project, if you go to the water and sanitation project, if you go to malaria and TB, you know, HIV and AIDS, all of them, they always give locals a priority. They always give them, you know, an opportunity to work and make change in their own community. And to me, that is really important because uh, I always say change uh, starts from the inside out. It's very hard for someone else to come from another place and even to gain trust from that community and make that change. People will say, you don't understand our language. You don't understand the reason we are doing FGM or the reason we are, you know, we are doing whatever we are doing. But now me being one of them or any other colleague of mine, being one of part of that community, one, there's confidence. They know like it's one of them who is going to make change. And I think the other thing is that these are donor funded projects. They are here for three years, for four years. And what happens if those lo local community members are you know, empowered? You know, I work with FGM project, even if the FGM project ends, I will not stop working for my community or for my village. So I think that's really, one beautiful thing I've seen from AMREF, really, right. it's an African organization, uh, you know, empowering its own people. And yeah, I can talk about it many. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the only so, organization I know. I've not worked for any other, and hopefully not, because it's just, so, yeah, the best. Thank you. Thank you, Naizan. We have only now, I think, two minutes remaining, then we hand over yeah. to them because people really want to ask you questions. Uh -huh. So maybe in, in those two minutes, you could tell us, at the end of the book, you talk about a nice place foundation. Uh, I would assume that this nice place <clears throat> is nice. Uh, and we have seen you be given very fond names, nice, Karembo, <laughs> Retepi. So could you tell us about this nice place foundation in two minutes about 
it's a leadership uh, center. It's from land that was given to you or donated by your father in the village that you grew up. What does it mean to you personally to see something like this come from your community, come up? So maybe in just two minutes, tell us about a Nice Place Foundation and your dream for it. Thank you. And um, I'll try to use two minutes because, you know, my work is to talk. I, I love talking, so sorry. And uh, A Nice Place is a leadership academy and a rescue center for girls. Uh, remember, we've been working on FGM issues, saving, protecting girls either from FGM and child marriage. But we are not saying we have saved the whole, uh, you know, either Kenya or, you know, the whole of Africa. We still have girls who are running away from either FGM or child marriage. And for many years, we've not been having a place to keep them. So I'm happy that now, you know, a nice place, safe home, uh, will be able, you know, girls have like a runaway, a place where they can go, they are safe, they are protected from all these harmful practices. And they also have a chance to continue with their education. We also have the leadership academy part. And we really, we've been able to reach over 20,000 girls from the alternative rights of passing. We call them, uh, yeah, you know, there are so many, I call them younger nices. And uh, we really want to continue equipping, equipping them with more leadership skills, advocacy skills, because, uh, you know, they are the future champions of Kenya or, you know, of Africa and all that. So we'll just be equipping them with different trainings uh, that will go for like three years. It's like a summer school one month in April, one month in August, one month in December. And then after that, we'll be connecting them with different organizations because we want to see really, we also want to nurture their talents. Some of them might be good in different things. And I think we'll really have like, you know, trainers who will be able to do that. So it's a beautiful project that I'm really proud of. It's one of the dream projects I've always wanted to do. And now that it's coming to a reality, um, I'm happy about it. And uh, we are opening it uh, officially next month. That's the 11th of October. And that's the day of the girl child. So we felt like there's no any other important or special day uh, than that day for us to do the official launch uh, of a nice place. So for whoever who is around Africa or close to Kenya or who is willing to travel to Kenya because winter is about to maybe get here, you're all welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Nice. As I hand over to Bob, I'll ask you one last question that just needs one answer. Which name do you prefer, Nice, Karembo or Reteti? Reteti. Now that I understand it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And over to you, Bob. There's so much we could talk about, but we won't finish this because there are so many other people, your fans from US, Canada, who might want to ask questions. So over to you, Bob, uh, from now on. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Nice. Thank you. Yes, nice. Thank you so much. Your story was so beautiful. And I've, I've known you for seven years and Nice is so much more than her story. Um, she doesn't really hasn't even had a chance to talk about her brilliant community organizing skills. And I remember the first time I met her, we spoke, she spoke for hours upon hours on how to organize her community. And I was a community organizer originally I, about her age when she started. And I was like, wow, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. So her story talks about there is her story but also all her strategies her techniques and how to move her community forward are really wonderful and enlightening for anyone who ever wants to be an organizer um so and then i just noticed that folks and then i'll turn it over are asking questions how they can support nice in other ways um I think someone put, uh, one of the ways the US office has been supporting is I think we've given over 300 scholarships to girls to support their education. And as Nice will tell you, there is no better investment than supporting uh, a young girl who's being rescued. So there's absolutely, we can you know provide, you can go to the website, just mark that you wanna to give to a nice place and we'll make sure we provide some more scholarships for girls. And Jenny, I can't, are you, do you have a track of questions that that people have been asking. <laughs> Would you mind just asking Nice that? Yeah. So nice one question that came in I really like was what is your favorite experience that you have had in the last few years as your story has become more well known? Sorry? What is your favorite experience you have had in the last few years? Now that people are starting to hear your story, as you are becoming more well known, have you had any exciting experiences as people learn about your story? 
<laughs> can you? Yeah, maybe Bob, could you repeat my question? I think I have an echo in here. Well, I probably could answer the question since I was with Nice, but I'll let her. Have you had any experiences since people have known you uh, and heard your story, maybe with celebrities that really kind of affected you? And it doesn't have to be, but any stories or experiences that you had that you'd like to share with folks? If there's any story, I don't know. I'm not getting the question. The, have you had any like experiences of you know famous people you've met or places you've gone that you want to share? Oh, of places I've gone. Or or people you've met. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mean like stories of people I've met, like celebrities, like, or anything or what? Yeah, sure, whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've met different people and um, amazing people. And uh, and it's just funny, maybe I'll talk about someone I met just the other day. I think I was Judy. I saw Judy, 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 Judy is my editor. She's also part of this call. And um, I think when I was doing the book signing there, uh, and I really felt like that was funny. Uh, there was a lady who came into the bookstore mm -hmm. and uh, she was buying a book. And then she was like, is that you? I was like, yeah. And then he was like, no, that is not you. Uh, did they? Why did they have to Photoshop your picture or something like that? I'm like, no, this picture is taken from my village. I'm like, no, 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 no. And, but I'm like, I'm telling you, it's, it's my picture, it's me. So it's like, but you look different here. Like maybe, but that's me. So I felt like that was funny. Someone trying to tell you, that is not you and you're saying <laughs> it's me. <laughs> that is funny. But uh, I think I've met really very interesting people, uh, you know, in different parts of the world and, uh, you know, being in different shows. And I think one of the favorite one was uh, The Daily Show. Uh, you know, Bob, anytime I'm here, Bob tries to, or anything I say I want to be, you know, anywhere I want to be when I'm in the US, you know, Bob is a big deal. I'm like, Bob, you know what? I love uh, The Daily Show. Can you make sure I can get there? He's like, yeah, nice. I mean, I got you. So he got me there. That was like the best thing. Uh, Trevor Noah's show is one of the best shows I've always wanted to go. I don't know for how many years he made me go there. You know, Helen was also my favorite person. I went there. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, Bob, so thank you. Uh, so most of the time I forget to say thank you to you. Maybe now I can just say I truly appreciate you. I remember when I also started that journey for the book, I was like, Bob, I want to do, I have someone. It's like, no, nice, I'll get you. So he was the one who made it actually all possible, he introduced me to Norm. We had coffee in, I can't remember where it was, and we went for coffee in the same place uh, three days ago when I was here. And uh, that is just how all this was made possible. So thank you, Bob, I know I forget to say thank you to you, but yeah, really, really thank you for making all this happen. I know Peter is also part of this call, Judy and everyone, thank you. We did have um, a question for you, Nice, or for Dr. Patahi. What does Reteti mean? Tree. Ah. What is? Reteti. Oh. <laughs> what is Reteti? Yeah. You know, I like that name because I was given by my father, and uh, Nailante is not my name, as I was reading in the first part. But as a child, you see, I didn't understand much the deep meaning of that meaning of that name. And, uh, you know, Reteti means hope or hope for the community, hope for the future. It's a very special tree back at home. Even if there is drought or anything, uh, people feel like if they have the tree around, they're sorted out with everything. So it means hope. Awesome. I think we have one more question, if anyone else, but... Um, and I know that um, Bob was just talking about this, but um, is there any other way? So I know we um, we have actually donors on the call who, who contribute 
scholarship program. Um, all of our donors do help in some way um, who give unrestricted money, but we are there any other ways that you would say um, that your work can be supported by AMRAP or by donors on the call? Yeah, you know, I always say if you educate a girl, you have educated the whole nation. And I think um, that is really one thing I like uh, Molly talking about. And just the other day when I was saying, uh, you know, I wish, you know, the way we have mobile banking in Kenya, we are using technology to do that. You can access your money from the couch when you're seated back in your home. You don't have to go to the bank. I wish we can spread education like that and make sure girls, you know, have opportunity, you know, to get an education and all that. So I think Bob will be the right person to help me answer that question. Yeah, but really supporting girls' education, supporting women you know, empowerment projects, it's 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 the way to go. Emily, Mutt, would you explain how much it costs, you know, in the project we work with uh, to provide scholarships for girls? Sure. Um, it's we. I think for the last couple of years, we we usually say around five hundred dollars per girl, um, which provides uh, their education fees for private for boarding school as well as dignity kits um, which are basically backpacks that we provide for each girl with all the um, necessities that they need for school including a mattress and bedding um, sanitation uh, products things like that um, and then we do education um, on hygiene, skills building, um, we do on women's rights, on, um, you know, whatever else they would need to um, self-autonomy and kind of uh, whatever they're not learning in school. We also make sure that they are learning like these life skills. Um, and then they, we also will do peer education training and um, mental health training and kind of make sure that they are having a holistic experience at the boarding school as well. And then, uh, sorry, we had someone raise their hand. Or sorry, Bob, we, was this the end of the oh, no, I was just gonna ask if there was more questions. Yeah, so um, Dorcas, I think you raised your hand. Did you have a question? I think actually she's might be paused. Hello, I'm trying to talk. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Um, nice. Um, I I really enjoyed your presentation and your courage and everything. Um, I've been in Kenya. I've lived in Kenya for some time, about two, almost three years. And I'm currently in school in the US. So I hope and I pray that I get to meet you some other time. Um, my question is, you said, um, for instance, when the AMREF and all those groups came to your village, you were among the few girls, or you were kind of the only girl who was um, who had gone to school at that time. Um, but I know from, from um, experience and meeting people, I know if, um, a couple of Maasai women and ladies who live elsewhere, like all over and in the cities, let's say in Nairobi, who are successful, who are, um, I mean, they are mentors and everything. So my question is, um, did they also go the path that you, like, is that the story of most, um, most of them, let's say, who don't live in the, in, in the Maasai community now? Is that the story that they, they become outcasts? Like maybe they, they tried to escape the process and became outcasts or they went through the process but they just don't feel comfortable going home. Yes, I'm, I'm asking this because of my own personal, like not to me, but I know coming from an African country, you know, all that you said, like that thing about the stigma, it's, it's really, it's real and it affects people in a lot of ways. So I just want to find out if the other Maasai women who are so resourceful, but are outside the community, is it that they still face that kind of stigma? That's why they can't come home or they are able to come home even if they've not gone through the cut. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, not really a difficult question, but I will say it depends because you have people probably because of career and education, they just chose another path and uh, probably they got married somewhere else or decided to live outside the village and do other things. But I'm not saying they're not also contributing, uh, 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 you know, to their community or anything. You know, that's uh, you know, it depends with how people decide, you know, to live their life. But uh, I get your point that you know, stigma is there, and uh, it's there to both sides. It's there to girls who have not been circumcised. You know, it's also there sometimes to girls who have undergone the cut. And uh, we all know already over 200 million women globally have already been affected by the cut. So even for us in our work, it's not just about protecting the ones who have undergone circumcision, but also trying to ensure we support the other ones. Uh, we give psycho social support to the women who have also undergone FGM. So uh, we have women who we are working with, or you know, they are also our champions, you know, who have undergone the cut, but also they have now come back to support girls, you know, to work in our bear projects and all that. So it's, it's, it's different. You might decide to live here, live anywhere else, not because you're not accepted in your community, but just because, you know, probably you feel comfortable, you feel safe being there. And uh, you see right now the community, uh, you know, if, uh, the attitude towards FGM has changed. It's not like before. Maybe our time, you couldn't speak out and say I've not been circumcised or you know, probably I've undergone the cut. You know, but at that time, people were not sensitized a lot about the issue. But you see, right now we have the law, we like in Kenya, we have the anti-FGM board whereby you know it was initiated by the president. So in Kenya, I would say everywhere, you know, in televisions, in radios, we have different organizations just like Cambria who are doing the same work. So I think now people are aware about the issue, people accept each other, people talk to each other. So it's not like when you go back home, you're not safe. No, others are, others are not, yeah. Thank you, Nice. Um, we only have a couple minutes and I just wanna thank everyone from Canada and the US for joining us. And so this, we're videotaping this. Uh, so, I'm just going to ask folks because, you know, we want her to sell as many books as possible for NICE and to let people know her great story. Um, we'll send everyone a video with a link to purchase the book. If you could share the video with friends and family, post on social media. I think we have social media materials that we'll send out. But please, you know, we had a great audience here, but please pass, uh, uh, get the word out. Good to, uh, Dr. Katahi, would you like to say anything? No, no, but nice. it's just to thank, thank Nice for her very powerful story and being vulnerable enough to share. Thank you. Nice, any final words of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Going yeah. after Dr. Gidinji, you know, he's, yeah. uh, I would say, a person with lots of wisdom, but just to thank everyone for making time for this. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Nice. Thanks everyone for joining. How are you? Was that 